Okay. There it was. Oh, Curtis? Yeah. You did the whatever you did. Just a few well, minutes. Well, I did short memory. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. But he's been on thyroid medicine since he was five and a half years old. Yep. It's, it's good to praise God. Amen. And that's what, you know, that, that's what we've been looking at. We started out last week looking at true worship. And we looked at Nebuchadnezzar and the image that he had set up and, and, and how he had commanded worship. But yet, even though they fell down, you know, that isn't a picture of true worship. And so we, we, we looked at that and, and identified what true worship is all about. So I want to revisit where we started out with. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1, let's just look at one verse. We're going to work our way down through this passage over the next few weeks, God willing. But verse 3 is, is the beginning of what we looked at last week. And it says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Praise be to God. You know, we, we've looked at what true worship is, but now let's look at this, uh, the idea of do we have a reason to worship? You know, can you examine your own life and say, I have a reason to praise God? You know, we, we, we looked at Daniel, we, we looked at his friends, and God had rescued him, and, or excuse me, rescued his friends from the fiery furnace. You know, they were under threat, and, and they said, we're, we're not going to do what you've commanded, O king. We're, we're going to be true to God. And God rescued them. Let me ask you, has God rescued you in your lives from the fiery furnace? You know, we know that there is a judgment waiting on a Christ-rejecting world, and we've been rescued before we've ever been thrown in, we've been rescued out of the flames of God's wrath. I think that alone is something to worship God about. But I want to continue to examine this idea of the blessings that we have received. So if you would now turn with me to 1 Samuel chapter 18. We're going to examine another uh, facet of God and, and his blessings towards us. But this is going to be through an earthly example that we are given. And this is 1 Samuel chapter 18. We're going to start out and just read for the first four verses here. But this is David. And chapter 17 is all about David defeating Goliath. We know that God blessed David. He was able to defeat him because he, he says, I, I come to you in the name of the Lord and I'm going to take your head. You know, the Philistines had been threatening, uh, you know, the, the nation of Israel. And it's like, David's like, why are you guys running? We serve a mighty God. And he stood on his faith. You know, and, and so we know the, the story how David defeated Goliath and he took off his head and he kept the sword. And, and so now Saul kind of likes him. Because Saul, you know, his enemies have been defeated for the nation of Israel. And so David and Saul are talking. You know, he's like, who is that boy? You know, I like him. And so, you know, that's where we kind of pick up the story. And in, in verse 1 of chapter 18, it says, After David had finished talking with Saul, Jonathan became one in spirit with David, and he loved him as himself. From that day, Saul kept David with him, and did not let him return to his father's house. And Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as himself. Jonathan took off the robe he was wearing and gave it to David, along with his tunic and even his sword, his bow and his belt. In these four verses, we see Jonathan and David 
A, a relationship has been established, a friendship. Jonathan is much older than David, but yet they're of, of like spirit, of like mind. And Jonathan says here he loves him. And, and it says here that they, uh, that they uh, made a covenant. Well, we went through a series called the Blood Covenant, and, and those words in English are kind of something that maybe we don't quite understand as well as we should. The, the term there, made, it, it really is the word karoth, and it's to cut. They cut a covenant that day. You know, some of you maybe remember growing up watching cowboys and Indians and, you know, how the Indians, you know, sometimes or the cowboys would make a, a blood covenant, an oath. You know, they would become blood brothers, you know, and blood was shed. And it was mingled, and, they, and it's basically that the, the two become one. Well, this is the idea here, is, is we're not told exactly the ceremony that was done, but a oath was established, and, and, and that a covenant was cut that day. And, and we know, you know, again, in, in, our, in our American ideology, you know, covenant, you know, it's, it's like a promise, Right? No. A covenant is a formal binding agreement. And when I say binding, it's beyond anything that, that we understand as Americans. Because in, in America, you know, if you have a, a contract with somebody, how easy is it to get out of? You just hire a good lawyer, right? Or, you know, it's like, well, yeah, we're not going to do that because, you know, we, did, we didn't fully understand all the terms. And, 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 and so you misrepresented things. No, a covenant was something that was established. You know, you understood the terms of it before that covenant was ever established. You know, it, it's a picture. I, and, and, and I enjoyed it. We just went through my daughter's wedding here recently. And, and that's a, a, a picture of a covenant ceremony. You know, it's supposed to be something that is established and lasts. You know, you got the, the, the families, you know, you got the males or the groom's parents on one side and the bride's parents on the other and the families that represent them. And they're there to observe this ceremony, to make sure it's done correctly. Because guess what? Now these two families are coming together. They're a part of it. It was interesting after, our, uh, after the wedding, uh, you know, uh, part of Jesse's family came to us and said, well, you're now a part of our family. You know, and that's what happens in a, in a covenant is two families or two peoples are joined together. Well, here we see David and Jonathan. They come together in this covenant. And it, and it goes on to, you know, and it's one of those things that, again, we wouldn't really understand it in our culture. But it says there that Jonathan took off his robe he was wearing and gave it to David. Your robe was, is who you were. It had, you know, for, for, for Jonathan, he was a part of his dad's army, you know, so it would have all the, his accomplishments on it. And it's basically saying, all that I am, I'm giving it to you. All that, 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 that I've been able to accomplish is now yours. And, and, and his tunic, you know, that's what kept him warm. He's saying, all that I have to be able to sustain me, I'm giving it to you. My sword. All that I have to be able to defend and, and, and to, to keep you from you know, being attacked by the enemy is, is now yours, David. And likewise, then David would have gave Jonathan his. So, so the idea here is, is that this covenant had been established between Jonathan and and David, and it's because Jonathan, you know, his soul was, it was he, he loved David. They were of like mind. But now if you would, turn with me to 2 Samuel chapter 9. Some time has passed. Jonathan is now dead. A part of the covenant ceremony is basically with the shedding of blood, you know, when that, that covenant is cut, it's basically saying the only way I can ever get out of this agreement is that if I die or if I break this covenant, I will have to die because I've broken this binding arrangement. So David technically has been released 
of this agreement, of this, of this covenant. Okay? But I want you to notice something. We're going to start out in verse 1 of 2 Samuel chapter 9. And David asks here, and it says, David asked, Is there anyone still left of the house of Saul to whom I can show kindness for Jonathan's sake? David is now the king. He's been through wars. The, the nation has finally been brought together underneath David's rule. And he's now remembering, because a part of that ceremony is, is, is you actually were to cut. A lot of times it was around the wrist, and so there would have been a scar there to remind him. And you, you, he would possibly have re looked down and seen that scar, and he's like, I'm in covenant. Because covenants affected the families. You know, he could have said, you know what, there, there's nobody left, you know, I've, I've destroyed, because a part of becoming king is you went out and you destroyed all of the remaining uh, heirs to the throne from the old regime. When you ascended to the kingship, you basically went out and took care of all the, the potential uh, combatants that would come in after you. But David here, he's looking down and he sees that scar and he's reminded. And he says, is there anybody still left of the house of Saul? Because of my covenant I made with Jonathan. See, it didn't just affect Jonathan, but he was covenanting with Jonathan for his, his descendants too. And he remembers that. In verse 2, it says, Now there was a servant of Saul's household named Ziba. They called him to appear before David, and the king said to him, Are you Ziba? Your servant, he replied. The king asked, Is there no one still left of the house of Saul to whom I can show God's kindness? Ziba answered the king, There is still a son of Jonathan. He is crippled in both feet. Where is he? the king asked. Ziba answered, He is in the house of Maker, son of Amiel, in Lodivar. Did you notice? He says there back in verse 3, Is there no one still left in the house of Saul to whom I can show God's kindness? This was something that they did when they established this covenant. It was in the presence of God. I think that's something that's missing from the, the marriage ceremonies that we see performed today. That they do it, and, and I, I, I'm amazed by some of the, the uh, you know, their, uh, the things that they say, you know, Here, here's what I agree to do, you know, I, I agree to make you chocolate chip pancakes on Sunday, and all these different things, and it's like, you know, no, you know, what kind of a, a, a oath is that, you know, these are our vows, I, I, I vow to you know, smile at you every other day. You know, just stupid things. Instead of realizing that you're making this vow in front of God. And as a pastor, you know, with my daughter's ceremony, I, I made sure that they understood that. You're making these vows to each other in the presence of God. And that's what Jonathan and David had done. They had made this covenant of friendship in the presence of the Almighty. It was binding to them. It meant something. And for David, he says, Now, is there nobody left that I can sh to whom I can show God's kindness from the house of Saul? I mean, this wasn't just a light friendship, was it? They had come together. All that I am, I give to you, and, and, and so help me God. I will do these things. Not only to you, but to your descendants. These families were brought together. And then, of course, Ziba, he replied, you know, there's still, you know, Jonathan had a son. <clears throat> David didn't even know about Jonathan's son. Like I said, Jonathan was dead. Saul was dead. David's king now. Everything is his. He, he, he has to answer to nobody. But yet, he's still worried, still concerned. 
It's still on his heart to fulfill this covenant relationship that he had. And, and it's not like, oh, he's got a son? Wow. The first thing he says, where is he? You know, he's excited. I want to know. Ziba answered, he is in the house of Maker, son of Amiel in Lo Debar. Names mean something in the Bible. Lo Debar means no pasture. He's dwelling in that place that has no pasture. He, you know, he, he was supposed to be the king. You know, he would be the descendant of Jonathan. You know, he was in line for the throne and now he's been run off. You know, like I said, the, you know, the first thing a, a, a conquering king would come in and do is eliminate all the family so that there wouldn't be anybody there trying to kill him later on. And I'm sure, you know, well, it's, it continues on. So King David had him brought from Lodi Bar, from the house of Maker, son of Amiel. When Mephibosheth, son of Saul, uh, Jonathan, the son of Saul, came to David, he bowed down to pay him honor. I'm sure Mephibosheth probably grew up hearing stories about David, how David had stolen the throne from, from his grandfather, how, you know, how David was probably coming for him, and how he barely had escaped. In fact, that's what caused him to be lame. The news came that, that Saul was dead and that Jonathan was dead, so Mephibosheth's nurse had picked him up and began to run and, and we're told that basically she fell and now he was crippled. You know, they didn't have sports medicine. They didn't have the kind of doctors that we have access to. And so he spent all of his life not being able to walk, probably resentful of David, probably resentful of the fact that his family had been, had, had, had been deposed, that that should have been rightfully theirs. And now here comes the king's men to get him. He's probably thinking, it took you long enough. You know, you finally found me, you know, and he, he, he's taken before the king, probably thinking, I'm dead. And, and, and it says there that, that um, he bowed down to David to pay him honor. David said, Mephibosheth, your servant, he replied. Don't be afraid, David said to him, for I will surely show you kindness for the sake of your father, Jonathan. I will restore to you all the land that belonged to to your grandfather Saul, and you will always eat at my table. David didn't have to do that, did he? But he was, un he was in covenant with Jonathan and, and with, with Mephibosheth there. He, Mephibosheth probably never even heard of this covenant that they'd established. And now David's telling him, I'm going to give everything to you that belonged to your grandfather. He was probably wearing rags there in Lodi Bar. Probably, you know, we're not told his ex exact condition, but he had no family left. I'm, I'm sure he was at, at, probably at rock bottom because he couldn't take care of himself. You know, in, in that culture, if you couldn't take care of yourself, you were pretty much forced to, to, to live <laughs> off the generosity of other people. He probably had to beg bread. Now he's taken before the king. And the king says, I'm going to give you everything that belonged to your grandfather, Saul. And notice it says there, and you will always eat at my table. <laughs> Things are, are changing for Mephibosheth, aren't they? He, he, he's going from having nothing to having everything. So let's continue to look here. And it says in verse 8, Mephibosheth bowed down and says, What is your servant that you should notice a dead dog like me? In that culture, there was nothing lower than a dog. And even lower than that was a dead dog. I mean, that's what he considered himself. 
I'm worth nothing. Why should you even consider me? And David wasn't necessarily considering him. He was considering Jonathan and the covenant that he'd established with Jonathan. Who, who's his, you know, his heart was knit to Jonathan's. And he's doing it because of, of, of his covenant with him and, and, and then showing him the love of God. He didn't deserve it, did he? Mephibosheth hadn't done anything to, you know, I hadn't written to the king saying, hey, I, I demand a, a, you know, an audience with you because some injustices have been done. I deserve to be in your presence. No. It was because of David's desire to honor God and honor that covenant that had been established. Verse 9. Then the king summoned Ziba, Saul's servant, and said to him, I have given your master's grandson everything that belonged to Saul and his family. You and your sons and your servants are to farm the land for him and bring in the crops so that your master's grandson may be provided for. And Mephibosheth's grand, or Mephibosheth, grandson of your master, will always eat at my table. Now Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. Then Ziba said to the king, Your servant will do whatever my lord the king commands his servant to do. So Mephibosheth ate at David's table like one of the king's sons. Mephibosheth had no claim to that spot. <coughs> he, he's in the presence of the king. Can you imagine when it came time for dinner and all the, the, the sons of David were gathered around and then here come Mephibosheth, probably being carried in by the servants. And they waited for him to be seated at the king's table. Mephibosheth had a young son named Micah and all the members of Ziba's household were servants of Mephibosheth. And Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem because he always ate at the king's table. And he was crippled in both feet. Here we have a picture, an earthly picture of what covenant is like. David had established this covenant. But Jonathan had died. But, but David's heart was to, to honor that covenant. That promise of love. Does it remind you of another story we have? We went back to where we started from. In Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3. We have been blessed with all spiritual blessings. Why? Because we are in Christ Jesus. There was a covenant established through Jesus. Because of the love of God. For God so loved the world that he gave us his only begotten son that whoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Anybody in here feel like Mephibosheth? Were we living out in the land of no pasture? The religions of this world, I mean, have you found out that you, you know, no matter how much you try, you find yourself hungering and maybe thirsting? Crippled, you can't take care of yourself. That's how I felt when I learned about the love of God through Jesus, my Savior. See, just like Mephibosheth, we didn't deserve it. <coughs> if it was just like the rest of the world, we should have died because there's been a change in kingship. This God of this age has been defeated. And now our king reigns. But our king is a king of life. And he offers that to us. One more passage. Hebrews chapter 10. If you would, turn there with me. Hebrews chapter 10. 
We're going to start out at verse 1. It's hard to back up and find a good place to start, but we'll start at the beginning of the chapter here. Talking about the law, because that's what we were under, the law of sin and death. And it says here in verse 1, the law is only a shadow of the good things that are coming, not the realities themselves. For this reason, it can never, by the same sacrifices repeated endlessly year after year, make perfect those who draw near to worship. That's, that's the subject we've been looking at, true worship. You know, why do we worship? How can we worship? Well, here we're told that the law cannot perfect those who are desiring to draw near to God. You know, year after year they would offer their sacrifices and it's the prescribed method and how they could approach God. But as we're told, it, it didn't take care of the sin problem. We were still under the law of sin and death. It says in verse 2, if it could, would they have not stopped being offered? For the worshipers would have been cleansed once for all and would no longer have felt guilty for their sins. And see, that's one of the problems, you know, as we come to God, we remember, don't we? I remember my sins. But the, the promise that we have, that we looked at last week, is that our sins have been forgiven in Christ Jesus. But those sacrifices are an annual reminder of sins because it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Therefore, when Christ came into the world, he said, sacrifice and offerings you did not desire, but a body you prepared for me. With burnt offerings and sin offerings, you were not pleased. Then I said, here I am. It is written about me in the scroll. I have come to do your will, O God. First, he said, sacrifice and offerings, burnt offerings and sin offerings, you did not desire, nor were you pleased with them, although the law required them to be made. Then he said, here I am. I have come to do your will. He set aside the first to establish the second. And by that will, we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. Two covenants. The first covenant was found in the law. And it was the law that, that basically was given to us that shows us that we need a Savior. That we couldn't fulfill the law's demands. I don't know about you, but I am thankful I don't have to get on an airplane and fly to Jerusalem to, to offer a sacrifice for my sins every time I mess up. I'd have a lot of air miles. And it'd be kind of expensive. What's the freight for a goat or lamb? <laughs> More than I want to consider. But again, and by that will, we have been made, or excuse me, yeah, and by that will, we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. The second covenant it was a better covenant, one made on better promises. It was established by Jesus, who was fully God and fully man, the two participants of the covenant. In the one we looked at, it was between Jonathan and David. Here, it's between our representative, Jesus himself, who was fully man, and God himself, who, who's Jesus. And it makes us holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus once for all. Day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties again 
And again, he offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when this priest had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. Since that time, he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool. Because by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. That verse right there blows my mind. He's made us perfect. I know I'm not perfect. I have flaws. But it's by his decree. It's by the covenant that he established. He said that all that he is, he gives to us. He offers us his robe of righteousness. What do we have to offer him? A filthy garment stained by sin. And he took that upon himself and took it to the cross and died for us. Verse 15, the Holy Spirit also testifies to us about this. First he says, this is the covenant I will make with them. After that time, he says the Lord, I will put my laws in their hearts and I will write them on their minds. Then he adds, their sins and lawless acts I will remember no more. See, a part of this covenant that, that God establishes with us through his son, Jesus Christ, is that our sins and our lawless acts, he decrees that he will remember no more. It's not that he forgets. He chooses not to remember them because of the sacrifice that was made for us. This is a good covenant for us. We're, we're just like Mephibosheth. We've been dwelling out in the land of no pasture. And now the king has come and summoned to him through Jesus Christ. We get to enter into his presence and you and I get to feast at his table continually, forever. Their sins and lawless acts I will remember no more. And where these have been forgiven, there is no longer any sacrifice for sin. See, it's not that we don't sin anymore. It's that our sins are covered. He chooses not to remember them. If you ever find yourself in a state where you have sin, the only thing that has happened is that our fellowship with God has been interrupted. It insulates us from him. I would encourage you to, to reread 1 John 1, 9 at that point. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Get that relationship restored. I, I know, you know, maybe it's just me, but have, have you ever had a disagreement with your spouse? Something comes between... I, I see a lot of heads shaking. I guess it's just me. <laughs> We've entered into that covenant relationship, right? I pronounce you man and wife. Yeah, we agreed to it. But something happens and that relationship is strained, right? We have to reconcile that relationship back. It's not that we stop being man and wife. It's just our fellowship has been, been broken. Same thing happens when we sin now as Christians. Our sins are forgiven, but our relationship has been strained, basically. See, I think we have a real good reason to worship God. We, let me reread that passage to you. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3 says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Amen. We get it all. Just like Mephibosheth, he got everything that belonged to his grandfather, the king. Well, 
we as Christians, we become co-heirs with Jesus Christ. What does he own? Everything. It, it's funny, people, you know, that, well, you know, we're no, no longer under the law, so I don't have to tithe or anything. No, we're just giving him back a portion of that which he shared with us. We've been blessed. But notice it says in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing. See, we were in Lodi Bar, yeah. in that place of no pasture. Jesus says, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He says, come unto him, and he'll give us the bread of life and the living water. He, he gives us everything that we ever need, and it's all found in Jesus Christ. I think we have answered our first question. Do we have a reason to worship? I think we do. We don't deserve what we've got, been given. Mephibosheth, he didn't deserve it. He was no longer in the royal family, basically. David had taken over the throne, but he remembered that covenant he had made. Well, God has established a covenant with us through his son, Jesus. And he desires to show us that godly love. In the Old Testament, it, it, the word is chesed. And I can't quite say it the way they do over there. You've got to put a lot of chesed. It's covenant love. See, God has promised to love us. He's in covenant with us to love us. He doesn't break a covenant. See, he would have fulfilled his covenant relationship with the nation of Israel. They're the ones that broke it. But now he has given us a better covenant, one that's found in his son, Jesus. And everything that we are as Christians is found in Jesus. It's in him we've been declared righteous. It's in him we've been declared justified. It's in him we've been sanctified. And it's in him we will be glorified. It's all about him. He is the gift that we have been given, the, the love of God, that covenant kind of love. But, you know, that's not the part that blows my mind so much as, yes, he loves us, but he also likes us. That, that messes with my mind. He wants to spend time with us. He wants that relationship. He wants that fellowship. That's why he's done all the things that he has done is so that we can come to his table and have that fellowship and we can eat bread at his table for forever. I don't know about you, but we have reason to, to praise him. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Why? For everything that he has done for us. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a reason to worship God. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for the message that you have given us through your word, Lord. The covenant that was established in your son's blood, Lord. Lord, help us to grasp what covenant really truly means. <clears throat> that it's a binding relationship that you have with us because your word says so. Lord, thank you for the blessings that we have received. And Lord, help us to worship you like you deserve in spirit and in truth. Not because, Lord, we hear the, 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 the musicians play or anything else, but Lord, because our heart desires to glorify your name. Because you have rescued us from that place of, uh, that was barren, Lord, the, 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 where we were under the curse of sin and death in that darkness. And, Lord, that you've brought us into that kingdom of light that is yours. And that you have shared that with us, Lord, through your Son. Lord, I pray, Lord, that you will continue to strengthen your people. To, to cause your word to come alive in us and help us, Lord, to, to just praise you like you deserve. Lord, we love you and we ask for your blessings. In Jesus' wonderful and precious name. Amen. Amen.